and dedication and the time that you put in for the immunizations team, we definitely wouldn't be able to get anything done without the work that you guys do for us. So Dr. Scott Goldstein will be our presenter today. And if you have any questions at all during the webinar, feel free to type them into the control panel on your right where it says questions and Dr. Goldstein will answer them at the end. So without further, further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Goldstein now. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for taking some time out of your Pulaski day to listen to this uh, presentation on childhood and adolescent immunizations. Uh, there is a lot to cover, so I'm going to talk pretty fast, uh, as fast as I can, like the FedEx guy in the 80s commercials. So uh, there's a lot to cover. If you have any questions, raise your hand, or you can text them into the box, and I will hopefully have some time uh, left over to get to them at the end. So today we're going to talk about the, uh, all the childhood and adolescent vaccines that are recommended by the CDC. There are many serious vaccine-preventable diseases that are still circulating in the U.S. and globally that can have serious or fatal consequences for children and adolescents. Ensuring that all kids receive the complete series of each recommended vaccine is important for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, as healthcare professionals, it's our job to prevent illness in patients whenever possible. Vaccines have the benefit of not only protecting the people who receive them, but also those who may not be able to receive them, uh, like those who are too young or too old to be vaccinated, or those with compromised immune systems. These vulnerable groups rely on well-vaccinated populations to stay healthy. There are also some less tangible benefits to vaccines as well. Uh, some vaccine-preventable diseases are acute, while others can cause chronic disease, and all can cause long-term health complications. The burden of all this illness in the healthcare system is huge. Keeping people healthy can save a significant amount of money, and there's also time and emotional savings to keeping people healthy. When a person, especially a child, gets sick, they're not the only one affected. Family and friends have to help the sick person with doctor visits, treatment plans, or daily activities they can't manage alone. And there can be an emotional toll on family and caregivers as well. Um, so right here is the complete recommended immunization schedule for children and adolescents up to age 18. That's put together by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP. The uh, yellowish-orange bars represent the optimal timing of administration for, sorry about that, for uh, each vaccine. And the, um, if a child falls behind the schedule or starts late, there are also recommended catch-up periods indicated in green. The purple bars um, indicate the recommended age range for certain high-risk groups. So we're going to talk about each vaccine and timing recommendations in greater detail in this module. So this is the catch-up immunization schedule for any children who may have started the immunizations later or not completed the series. A schedule shows the minimum amount of time that's necessary to wait between each dose. I'm going to talk a little bit about the concept of, of cocooning. Uh, babies under six months of age are vulnerable to many vaccine-preventable diseases because they're too young to receive all vaccines, and they have higher rates of infection and more serious outcomes for some diseases. Cocooning refers to a way of protecting babies from these harmful diseases. Older kids and adults are the primary way that babies get infected, like whooping cough and influenza can be particularly contagious and harmful to those under six months. All people who may come into contact with the baby, including grandparents, siblings, and caregivers, should be fully vaccinated. This creates a cocoon of protection to help keep the baby safe. So now we're going to go through uh, each vaccine and the disease that it protects against in more depth. We're going to start with hepatitis B. Uh, it's important that a child's first dose of the hepatitis B vaccine be given at birth before they're even discharged from the hospital. This is strongly recommended even if the mother is not infected with hepatitis B. Given the first dose at this point has been shown to increase the likelihood of a child completing the series and also acts as an extra layer of protection against perinatal infection in case the mother's hepatitis B status is unknown or incorrectly documented. If the mother is known to have a hepatitis B infection, the baby should still receive the first dose of vaccine in addition to a dose of hepatitis B immune globulin within 12 hours of birth. The hepatitis B vaccine is given as a three-dose series. Uh, the recommended schedule is to give the first dose at birth, followed by a second dose at one or two months of age. Uh, there needs to be a minimum of four weeks after the first dose before the second dose. And the third dose is given at six to 18 months of age, and there needs to be a minimum of 16 weeks between the or after the first dose and eight weeks after the second dose. It's important to note that only the monovalent vaccines Recombivax and Energex can be given at birth. 
the combination vaccines, Convax and Pediorix, can only be given after six weeks of age. And there's something called Twinrix for adults over age 18. Convax is not given to those over 71 months, and Pediorix is not given to those over seven years. If a child doesn't follow the recommended vaccine schedule, they can still finish the hepatitis B immunization on the catch-up schedule, where they receive the uh, three-dose series that's outlined in the schedule, uh, the catch-up schedule. There's also an adult vaccine that's given as a two-dose series to, to those between 11 and 15 years old, and it has to be a minimum of four months between those doses. So um, as I said, Recombivac and Energex are the single-agent vaccines that protect against hepatitis B, just hepatitis B. There are three other combination vaccines. Um, Convax protects against Mopolis influenza type B and hepatitis B, and Twinrix protects against hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Pediorix protects against DTP, polio, and hepatitis B. And um, it's important to note that any of these vaccines can be used to complete the hepatitis B series, so you shouldn't delay or stop the series if it's not possible to use the same brand the entire time. All of these vaccines are given intramuscularly, and all should be stored between 36 and 46 degrees. The only contraindication, and uh, this is a contraindication for every vaccine, is severe allergic reaction to the previous vaccine dose or one of the vaccine components in the past. There's a precaution to giving a vaccine if a patient has a moderate or severe acute illness with or without a fever. And for the hepatitis B, there's a precaution to giving the vaccine if the baby is under four pounds. There are three different types of hepatitis B infection. Acute infection is a new hepatitis B infection and may or may not cause symptoms. Uh, and acute infection can also cause, cause chronic long-term infection. And young adults are at the highest risk for becoming chronically infected with about 90% of infants and about 25 to 50% of children aged one to five becoming chronically infected. Perinatal infection occurs when an infected mother passes the infection to a newborn baby. Without vaccination, approximately 40% of babies who are born to hepatitis B infected mothers will get chronic hepatitis B infection. Hepatitis B is transmitted through contact with infected blood or body fluids. Um, it's important to note the infection cannot be spread through food, water, sharing utensils, breastfeeding, hugging, kissing, hand-holding, coughing, or sneezing. The symptoms of hepatitis B infection include fever, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, dark urine, joint pain, and jaundice. Although most children under age five will not have any symptoms, and only uh, 30 to 50 percent of children age five and older are symptomatic. So that means the hepatitis B infection can be even harder to diagnose in young children. Up to 1 percent of those with acute hepatitis B will die from the acute hepatitis B infection with uh, over 60, those over 60 usually having higher rates of fatality. There's no treatment for acute infection, just symptomatic treatment. The symptoms of chronic infection can range from no symptoms to liver diseases such as cirrhosis and cancer. Of children who uh, develop chronic infection, 25 percent will die prematurely. There is antiviral drug treatment for chronic infection, which also requires regular lifelong monitoring for disease progression. Hepatitis B must be reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health within seven days of diagnosis and is nationally notifiable to the Center for Disease Control. This is some pictures um, of hepatitis B patient and a video of the family's story of hepatitis B. It talks about why vaccinating um, that birth is so critical. The next vaccine we're going to talk about is rotavirus. Uh, rotavirus is given um, Min the minimum age of the first dose is six weeks of age, and the maximum age of the first dose is 14 weeks and six days. Um, and neither vaccine series should be started after this point. The maximum age for the final dose of vaccine for rotavirus is eight months of old. The rotavirus vaccines have a narrower window of administration than some other recommended vaccines, so it's important that providers complete one of the two series within the outline time frame. It's also important for providers to understand the contraindications before administering this vaccine. Contraindications to rotavirus vaccine are severe allergic reaction to a previous dose or a component, severe combined immunodeficiency, or a history of intussusception, which is a uh, disease where one part of the intestine slides into the basin part. Precautions for giving the rotavirus vaccine are a moderate to severe acute illness with or without fever, immunodeficiency other than severe combined immunodeficiency, chronic gastrointestinal disease, spina bifida, or bladder atrophy. There are two rotavirus vaccines available, and both are given orally. Rotatech is a live virus vaccine given at age 6 to 32 weeks. It's a refrigerated vaccine. Rotarix is also a live vaccine given at 6 to 24 weeks. Rotarix is different because it's stored in a lyophilized form that has to be reconstituted with an included diluent before it can be administered. 
um, and you should only use the diluent from the Rotorix vaccine. The, that vaccine is also stored at 36 to 46 degrees. It's important not to freeze the vaccine or the diluent. Uh, and once reconstituted, they should be given as quickly as possible and preferably within 24 hours. Um, if the vaccine is frozen, it has to be thrown away. The recommended schedule for giving these vaccines is similar for both of them, with the main difference being that the, the tech requires three doses and the Rotorix requires two doses. Uh, Rotorix is usually given at two, four, and six months, with a minimum of four weeks between doses, and Rotorix is usually given at two and four months, um, with a minimum of four weeks between the doses. So rotavirus infection is, the, is most common in infants and young children, though adults can be infected too. Prior to the introduction of the rotavirus vaccine in 2006, most children in the U.S. have been infected with rotavirus by age five. Infection can occur year-round, but has higher rates from December through May. Rotavirus particles are shed in the feces of an infected person and then can enter a susceptible person's mouth and cause infection. This occurs from contact with contaminated hands and objects like toys, surfaces, food, and water. Infected people shed the most viral particles when they have diarrhea and for the first three days after recovery. Infection is self-limiting and typically lasts for three to eight days. Anyone is susceptible to rotavirus for children in child care centers are at high risk of infection. After exposure, symptoms usually develop in two days. Symptoms include watery diarrhea, vomiting, fever, and abdominal pain, and other symptoms can include loss of appetite and dehydration. The infection is most severe in unvaccinated children aged 3 to 35 months. Before the vaccine was introduced in the U.S., rotavirus infections were responsible for more than 400,000 physician visits, more than 200,000 emergency department visits, up to 70,000 hospitalizations, and up to 60 deaths every year in the U.S. from children under age 5. The rotavirus vaccine is estimated to protect, prevent 40 to 50,000 hospitalizations in the United States every year for infants and young children. And globally, rotavirus is still a leading cause of severe diarrhea in children and causes almost 500,000 deaths in 2008. There is no therapy uh, for rotavirus infection other than um, rehydration. About one in 70 children who get rotavirus will need to be hospitalized for IV fluid. And it's also important to note that a child can become infected multiple times, uh, even if they were infected previously or been vaccinated. And this is because prior infection or vaccination does not provide 100% immunity from the virus. The picture on the left here shows symptoms of dehydration, and the photo on the right shows the doctor examining a dehydrated child with rotavirus infection. The video link shows a physician telling a story about the potentially deadly impact of rotavirus infection in children. Okay, now we're going to talk about the vaccines for uh, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. There are two different types of vaccines we're going to explore. The difference is that one is for children under age 7, while the other is for those over age 7. A helpful way to differentiate between these vaccines is the uppercase letter refers to the full strength doses of vaccine, while the lowercase refers to reduced doses. Children under 7 receive the full strength dose of diphtheria, tetanus, toxoid, and pertussis, and adolescents and adults receive the reduced dose of diphtheria and pertussis. The A in the vaccine name refers to acellular pertussis, meaning that the pertussis vaccine component only contains part of the pertussis organism. The DTP vaccine is a five-dose series for children under age seven. There are several brands that can be used. Uh, all are combinations against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, but some protect against other diseases as well. There's one called Tripedia that has been discontinued, um, but it can be combined with active against Haemophilus influenza B. Penticel uh, protects against DTP, Haemophilus influenza B, and polio. Pediorix protects against hepatitis B and DTP. And Kinrix and Quadricel are different than, from the other ones in that they can be only used as the fifth dose uh, for children aged four to six years. Kinrix and, Kinrix and Quadricel also protect against polio. The recommended schedule is two months, four months, six months, 15 to 18 months, and four to six years. However, the first dose can be given at a minimum age of six weeks, and the fourth dose can be given as early as 12 months, as long as six months have elapsed since the third dose. Um, if a child falls behind the immunization schedule, they can still finish the series. There has to be four weeks between the first and second doses, and between the second and third doses, and six months between the third and fourth doses, and fourth and fifth doses. Um, if a child receives their fourth dose at four years or older, they do not need to receive a fifth dose. And if a child does not complete the vaccine series by age seven, they'll complete it with the Tdap vaccine, which we're going to discuss. Um, DPAP vaccine is refrigerated, given intramuscularly, it shouldn't be frozen. And DPAP has a long list of contraindications and precautions. Uh, there's a reference uh, list, a reference attached that tells um, what goes in 
what those precautions are. So um, the Tdap and TD vaccines are a continuation of protection uh, for adolescents and adults over age seven. They're given in addition to the DPAP vaccine series we just talked about and can be used to help catch up older children who aren't fully immunized. Tdap vaccines are for use in children 10 and older and have the trade names Adacel and Boostrix. TD vaccines are used in those age seven and older and have the trade name Decavac and Penavac. Uh, the Massachusetts Public Health Biologic Lab also makes a TD vaccine that does not have a trade name. It's recommended that children receive a Tdap dose between age 11 and 18, although it's preferred to do this between 11 and 12. TD booster shots need to be given to all adults every 10 years or as needed in case of exposure. If an adolescent does not receive the Tdap vaccine between 11 and 18, they should receive it as soon as possible at any age. This Tdap can replace any one of the 10-year TD booster doses. If a child did not complete the Tdap vaccine by seven years, they're not fully protected and should complete the series according to the ACIP catch-up schedule. The catch-up doses need to be tailored to each individual based on their history, but it is prefer that the first catch-up dose be Tdap. The remaining doses can be TD. If Tdap is given for a catch-up dose, then it is important they do not receive the Tdap at 11 to 12 years. Instead, they receive the TD booster 10 years after their last Tdap. Uh, the Immunization Action Coalition is a table that summarizes the Dtap, Tdap, and TD vaccine and is a really good resource. So uh, the Tdap vaccine the Tdap vaccine is uh, particularly important for pregnant women. You should be vaccinated um, with each pregnancy, preferably at 27 to 36 weeks. If they're unvaccinated at the time of birth or if the vaccine status is unknown, the Tdap vaccine should be given immediately postpartum before the mother goes home. The Tdap vaccine in pregnant women has two main benefits. First, the maternal antibodies can transfer to the baby and offer some protection before they can receive their first dose of Tdap, and also prevents the mother from passing disease to the newborn baby. Uh, pertussis in particular is highly contagious and infants are at the highest risk for severe or fatal complications, so it's critical to keep them protected before they can begin, begin the DPAP series. So just a little bit about uh, some basics about these diseases. Diphtheria is a bacterial infection caused by Carinobacterium diphtheria. It travels through the respiratory system where they produce a harmful toxin. Diphtheria is not common in the U.S. thanks to the vaccine, but it still presents an important global health issue. Diphtheria is spread from person to person, usually through respiratory droplets from coughs or sneezes, um, and it can also spread from contaminated objects. Symptoms include sore throat, weakness, fever, swollen glands, and after two to three days of symptoms, usually a thick layer of pseudomembrane can also form in the throat or nose and make breathing difficult. Uh, this membrane is made by um, a bacterial toxin that can also get into the bloodstream and travel to other organs and cause serious damage. Complications from diphtheria are very serious and include heart muscle damage, nerve damage, paralysis, skin lesions, and lung infection. The mortality rates are very high with 5 to 10 percent of patients dying with, even with treatment. Children under age 5 can have even higher case fatality rates up to 20 percent. Untreated it is fatal in the half of all cases. Uh, diphtheria is treated with a combination of antitoxin and antibiotics and must be reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health immediately. Diphtheria used to be a leading cause of illness and death in children in the U.S., but since the introduction of vaccines in the 1920s, those rates have plummeted. Um, between 2004 and 2008, there were no cases of diphtheria in the United States, although there are cases elsewhere in the world. This is a picture of a child with a swollen neck and a pseudomembrane from uh, diphtheria. Tetanus is a bacterial infection um, caused by Clostridium tetany. This toxin produced by these bacteria can get into a person's central nervous system, including the spinal cord and brain, and into the sympathetic nervous system as well. There are three different forms of tetanus. The most common is the generalized form, with 80% of cases falling into this category. This typically begins with muscle spasms in the jaw, known as locked jaw, and they can cause spasms in muscles throughout the body, such as the back and neck. Localized tetanus is when muscle spasms are confined to the area of the body where the bacterial exposure occurred. And systolic tetanus can occur when the bacteria enter through a lesion on the head or face. This form usually causes slack cranial nerve palsies rather than spasm. Both localized and systolic tetanus can progress into generalized tetanus. The bacteria that cause tetanus are present in soil, dust, and manure, and uh, most commonly enter a person's body through broken skin. Um, some wounds are more likely to cause infection. These include wounds exposed to feces, saliva, dirt, 
puncture wounds, burn wounds, crushing wounds, injuries, and injuries, any injuries with dead tissue. Cases of tetanus in the U.S. have decreased by 95% since reporting began in 1947, mainly due to widespread immunization. And now cases are most commonly found in adults who have not had their childhood vaccines or their booster. Tetanus is a medical emergency requiring immediate hospitalization and treatment. And treatment includes tetanus immune globulin, uh, tetanus tactile booster, muscle relaxants or sedation, wound care, and antibiotics. It must be reported to the Department of Public Health uh, if you ever see it. This is a man with, who had locked off um, and a child with muscle spasms from tetanus. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, is a bacterial infection caused by aborted pellipertussis. These bacteria produce toxins and other harmful substances to cause disease symptoms. There are three stages of pertussis, beginning with something called the catarrhal stage. At this point, pertussis resembles a typical cold with a low-grade fever, runny nose, and mild cough that becomes more severe. The catarrhal stage usually lasts seven to ten days, and this is followed by severe rapid bits of coughing with this characteristic whoop noise that accompanies the inhalation of air. This whoop is not always present in adolescence, but pertussis still needs to be kept in mind in the differential diagnosis of an adolescent or any child with a, with a uh, cough. Post-cough vomiting and fatigue are common in this stage as well. The coughing attacks can occur some, anywhere from 15 to hundreds of times a day and are usually worse at night. This stage usually lasts for one to six weeks. And then the final stage is the convalescent stage, and this is when recovery begins. Coughing lessens in frequency and severity, but it can continue from two to six weeks longer. Infants with pertussis may exhibit only apnea and not the characteristic paroxysms of cough, but it's particularly important to diagnose pertussis in this population because they're most at risk for severe or fatal complications. About half of infected infants younger than age one will, will require hospitalization. The incidence of pertussis has decreased greatly since the vaccine was introduced, but 2012 saw the highest number of cases since 1955. There were 20 deaths that year. Children under age one still experience the highest incidence of pertussis of any age group and are also most at risk for severe outcomes. Children age seven to 10 have the second highest rate of infection. Pertussis is spread like a cold through respiratory droplets. Often younger children get it from older siblings or caregivers who have mild symptoms and might not realize they have pertussis. Um, infants and in infants' complications include uh, pneumonia, convulsions, and encephalopathy. Half of babies under age one who are infected require hospitalization, and 1% of those will die. Adults and teens can also uh, have complications including weight loss, rib fractures from coughing, pneumonia, loss of uh, bladder control, and fainting from coughing. About 5% of teens and adults who are infected require hospitalization. Uh, early treatment can help lessen symptoms as well as decrease the time the person can spread the disease, and pertussis is usually treated just with an antibiotic. Prophylactic treatment should be given to anyone in close contact with someone who has pertussis. And pertussis should be reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health uh, within 24 hours of diagnosis. This is a child who has uh, broken blood vessels in the eye and facial bruising from coughing, and a baby who's hospitalized and intubated um, from pertussis. And there's a video link here um, about the importance of vaccinating. The next vaccine we're going to discuss is for, is for Haemophilus influenza type B. Um, this vaccine was introduced in 1990, and the incidence of infection in infants and children has decreased by 99% since then. There are several types of vaccine available. Um, act hip protects only against hib, but can also be reconstituted and given with um, trihibit, which protects against DTP. There's something called menhibrix, which is a combination vaccine against hib and Neisseria meningitidis, which causes meningitis. Penticella is a combination vaccine that protects against DTaP, hib, and polio. Pedvax hib is a single agent vaccine. Combax protect, protects against hib and hepatitis B. And Hibarex is a single agent vaccine and is only used as a booster dose. The ACT-HIB, Menhibrix, and Penticel vaccines are given a uh, total of three doses, at two months, four months, and six months. The Pedvax hib and Combax vaccine, vaccine require two doses. The first dose is at two months, uh, but can be given as early as six weeks, and the second dose is given at four months. Those two vaccines do not require a six-month dose. All conjugate HIB vaccines can be used interchangeably if the brand of the original dose is unknown or unavailable. Regardless of which vaccine series a child receives, they should also get a booster at 12 to 15 months. And any type of HIB vaccine that we talked about can be used for the booster. There's another HIB booster named Hibarix that can be given to children at age one to four years as long as they've had one prior dose of HIB. The catch-up schedule is complicated and depends on which vaccine series a child started, their current age, and their number of doses. 
uh, and there's an algorithm links on the slide. One thing that is true for all children is if they are unvaccinated or the vaccine status is unknown at age 50, uh, they, they should receive one dose by age 50 months of any type of flu vaccine. Uh, this slide reviews the storage of the various brands, um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's given intramuscularly. Certain groups of children are at higher risk of hip infection and have special vaccine recommendations. Um, they mean, some kids are immunocompromised, uh, like those getting chemotherapy, those with asplenia, HIV, or immunoglobulin deficiency. Children aged 12 to 59 months who are at increased risk for hip infection and have had zero to one doses of vaccine prior to 12 months should get two doses eight weeks apart. And children aged 12 to 59 months who are at increased risk and have had two or more doses prior to 12 months should get one dose. Children under age five who are undergoing chemotherapy or radiation treatment who received the vaccine doses in the 14 days prior to treatment or during treatment need to have those doses re-given. Anyone who has received a stem cell transplant needs a three-dose series six to 12 months after the transplant and those doses should be four weeks apart. And any under-immunized child under age 15 months, or I'm sorry, who are 15 months or older who are undergoing elective splenectomy should get a single dose of any of vaccine. The contraindications are severe allergic reaction uh, or age less than six weeks. And precautions, as usual, are the uh, moderate to severe illness with or without fever. So there are six identifiable types of Haemophilus influenza infection, A through F, and there are some other non-identifiable types. The vaccine only protects against type B infection. Hemophilus influenza with type B bacteria typically remain in people's nose or throat without causing symptoms, or they cause minor infections like bronchitis or ear infections. However, the bacteria can move to other parts of the body and cause more serious infections, including pneumonia, bacteremia, meningitis, epiglottitis, cellulitis, and infectious arthritis. Since the introduction of the vaccine in 1990, H-flu is, uh, has decreased dramatically, but kids under age five still experience the highest rate of infection in the United States. The children at highest risk of infection are infants too young to have completed the series and under immunized children. HIV is transmitted uh, via respiratory droplets or direct contact. Uh, symptoms depend on which specific type of bacterial infection the person contracts and can range from fever or cough, uh, nausea, or any of those more severe symptoms we talked about before. Prior to the introduction of the vaccine, 20,000 children under age five had, in, had um, invasive HIV infections annually, and 1,000 of those died. There are significantly less H. flu infections now, but most invasive HIV infections still require hospitalization. Up to 20% of children with HIV meningitis have neurologic sequelae, including deafness, and 3 to 6% of these die. The treatment for HIV in, uh, from simple to invasive is antibiotics. Invasive HIV must be reported to the Department of Public Health. These photos illustrate the seriousness of invasive infection. The infant on the right has a skin infection on the foot, or the left has yeah, a skin infection on the foot, and the baby on the right has severe brain gangrene of the hand due to septic CBN. The next vaccine we're going to talk about is the one against pneumococcal disease. Um, this vaccine is called the PCV13 vaccine, which protects against 13 different strains of pneumococci. It's usually given as a four-dose series, two, four, six months, and the fourth dose between 12 and 15 months. There is also a 23-valent pneumococcal vaccine that's given to children two and older who have certain underlying conditions that put them at high risk for pneumococcal infection. The table at the bottom of the slide outlines exactly which underlying conditions require the 23 valence and whether one or two doses is needed. The catch-up schedule for the PCV13 vaccine is very complex and is determined on an individualized basis. There's an algorithm created by the CDC on the slide there. Uh, the PCV13 vaccine is given intramuscularly, and the 23-valent vaccine is given intramuscularly or subcutaneously. Uh, they're refrigerated, not frozen, and the contraindications are the usual. Um, so there's two pneumococcal vaccines that protect against pneumococcal disease. Pneumococcal disease is a bacterial infection caused by Streptococcus pneumonia. Uh, it can cause many types of infection. It's the most common cause of bacteremia, pneumonia, meningitis, and middle ear infection in young children. Pneumococci can cause invasive disease when they travel to uh, sites of the blood that are normally stable, sites of the body that are normally stable, like the blood, lungs, and brain, or through the spinal fluid. Invasive pneumococcal disease, which includes bacteremia, pneumonia, and meningitis, is a nationally notifiable disease. Prior to routine vaccination, pneumococcal disease took a serious toll on children under 
for age 5, causing 13,000 cases of bacteria, 700 cases of meningitis, 5 million ear infections, and 200 deaths. Vaccination has greatly improved these statistics, but some groups of children are still at higher risk of pneumococcal disease than others. These include those under age 2, those in group care, those with sickle cell anemia, HIV or chronic heart or lung disease, those with cochlear implants, and those with CSF leaks. Uh, pneumococci are typically found in the respiratory tract of children and adults, with an estimated 20 to 60 percent of school-age children being carriers. It is unclear why the pneumococci do not cause disease in all carriers, but this is the reservoir from which the bacteria can spread to others and cause disease. It spreads via, via respiratory droplets um, and through saliva. Rates of disease increase in the winter and early spring, along with most other respiratory infections. The symptoms and complications of the most common forms of pneumococcal disease are listed on the slide. Um, they, these complications could be severe or deadly. Of children under age 5 who get pneumococcal bacteremia, 1% will die. And if they get pneumococcal meningitis, 1 in 15 will die. It's treated with antibiotics, but there's been an increase in antibiotic resistance trains. In about 30% of cases of pneumococcal disease, the bacteria is resistant to at least one type of antibiotic normal used in treatment. The treatment challenges of pneumococcal disease underscore just how important prevention by vaccination is. Invasive pneumococcal infection in those under age 5 should be reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health within seven days of diagnosis. Uh, this is a video about uh, the importance of protecting against pneumococcal disease. Now we're going to talk about polio. Um, we're going to talk about the inactivated poliovirus vaccine. There's also an oral poliovirus vaccine, but it has not been used in the United States uh, since 2000, so we're not going to talk about it in this presentation. The inactivated polio vaccine is given as a four-dose series. Um, there's a single-agent polio vaccine, and then there are combination vaccines. Pediorix protects against PTP, hepatitis B, and polio. Penticel protects against DTP, Hib, and polio. Kenrix and Quadricel protect against DTP and polio and are used for the last dose, as we talked about before. The recommended schedule is to get four doses at two months, four months, six months, through 18 months, and then eight. Fourth, uh, fourth dose given at four to six years. The first dose can be given as early as six weeks, but there's, it's not recommended to move the series up unless there's a reason such as travel to a country where polio is endemic. If a child needs to catch up on the series, it's necessary to have a minimum of four weeks between the first and second and second and third doses, and a minimum of six months between the third and fourth doses. The third dose is given when a child is four years or older at least six months after the second dose, so no fourth dose is required. Um, no polio vaccine is currently recommended for adults over age 18. These are given um, either intramuscularly or uh, subcutaneously and are refrigerated and protected from light. And the contraindications are the usual. So poliomyelitis is a disease uh, caused by poliovirus, which is no longer endemic in the United States, but still active in other countries where it could be imported by a global traveler. In 2014, 10 countries still had circulating poliovirus. The key to eradicating polio in the U.S. was near universal vaccine rates. And routine vaccination is critical to maintain the success. The virus itself is highly contagious and transmitted from person to person, most commonly via the fecal oral route. Although most people who get infected will not have any symptoms. Uh, about a quarter of those infected will have flu-like symptoms uh, that last for up to a week. And a smaller number will have much more severe complications. About 4% will have meningitis and up to 1% will have paralysis or weakness. Paralysis is the most serious complication of polio because it can lead to permanent disability and death. 2 to 10% of those who have paralysis will die because of uh, paralysis of the respiratory muscles. And this is what the iron lung machine that was commonly associated with polio was designed to assist. Uh, even if a child does not have symptoms early in the infection, it's still possible they can have muscle pain, weakness, or paralysis up to 40 years later as an adult. This is called post-polio syndrome. And here is a video about polio vaccine and some pictures of the iron lung and um, children who are affected by polio. Okay, moving on to the influenza vaccine. The United States has a universal recommendation that anybody age six months or older be uh, vaccinated routinely against um, against influenza unless medically contraindicated. However, there are a few contraindications. Children between six months and eight years of age may need one or two doses, depending on the algorithm shown here. Uh, if a child has received two or more total doses of the trivalent or quadrivalent flu vaccine before July 1st, 2015, they get one dose of the 2015-16 vaccine. The 
two or more the two or more doses from prior to July 1st do not need to be from the same flu season or even consecutive flu season. If a child has not received two or more doses prior to July 2015, or if their immunization history is unknown, which have two doses of the 2015-16 vaccine at least four weeks apart. So there, uh, we're, we're going to talk about intramuscular or IIV intramuscular um, vaccine and the the uh, live vaccine, the LAIV or intranasal vaccine. The IIV vaccines are given intramuscularly while the live attenuated is given intranasally and both are stored in both the refrigerators. The flu vaccine shouldn't be given to anybody who has a severe allergic reaction um, to the vaccine before or any component, including egg protein. There are further contraindications for the live attenuated vaccine. It shouldn't be given to children taking aspirin or to those aged two to four years if they have asthma or have had a wheezing episode in the past 12 months. Other contraindications to the live attenuated vaccine are immune suppression, certain chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease, pregnancy, and when influenza antiviral medication has been used in the previous 48 hours. Further details on these contraindications and guidance for patients with egg allergy can be found in the NMWR link provided above on the slide. Moderate to severe acute illness with or without fever is a precaution for both vaccines, and a history of developing Guillain-Barre within six weeks after a previous dose of flu vaccine is also a precaution. A mild allergic reaction to eggs resulting in only hives is a precaution to the injected vaccine, and the egg allergy guidance from the CDC should be followed. Children aged five and older who have asthma can be given the nasal spray, though there is an increased risk of, risk of wheezing after the administration. Also, the safety of the live attenuated vaccine uh, in persons with underlying medical conditions that might predispose them to complications after getting the flu, like chronic pulmonary or cardiovascular disease, kidney, liver, neurologic, uh, hematologic disease, or metabolic disorders, has not been established. People who care for severely immunosuppressed individuals who require a protective environment should not receive the nasal spray, or they should avoid contact with such individuals for seven days after they get the nasal spray given the theoretical risk of transmission from the live community of vaccine virus. Okay. So the annual influenza vaccine protects against the influenza virus circulating that season. These viruses can cause a respiratory infection to come on suddenly and range from mild to severe and can even result in hospitalization or death. There are three types of influenza virus, A, B, and C. Human influenza A and B viruses cause seasonal epi epidemics nearly every winter in the U.S. Influenza A causes moderate to severe illness in all age groups and can infect humans and some animals like birds and pigs. Influenza B typically causes milder infections that primarily infect, affect children uh, and only affects humans. Influenza C causes a mild respiratory illness and is not thought to cause an epidemic. Every year, an estimated 5 to 20 percent of the U.S. population will get influenza. It occurs across all age groups, but young children have the highest rate of infection. It's spread from person to person via respiratory droplets. And the season um, goes from October to May, with peak activity occurring from December to February. It seems like it's peaking um, now. The influenza map I just looked at looks like Illinois is kind of is a, is a getting or either around the peak. It's much higher than any states around, which is kind of what we're seeing, at least in my office. Uh, symptoms include fever, chills, cough, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose, muscle ache and fatigue. Vomiting and diarrhea are also symptoms that are more commonly seen in children. Most people recover in anywhere from a few days to a couple weeks, but some will get uh, more serious complications, especially um, they have a, those who are very young or elderly and those who are pregnant and have chronic medical conditions. Complications include pneumonia, bronchitis, uh, worsening of chronic illnesses, and death. Asthma patients experience high rates of influenza-related hospitalizations due to respiratory complications. Children with neurologic disorders also experience high rates of severe complications and death, and those aged two and younger face the highest risk of mortality. And in the last flu season, there were 65 hospitalizations for 100,000 people. The highest rates of hospitalization occur in those over age 65, with children aged zero to four being the second highest rate. Since 2004, the total number of influenza-associated pediatric deaths has ranged from 34 to 171 with 145 deaths last flu season. Influenza can be treated with antiviral drugs or with supportive care for the symptoms. Uh, an influenza-related hospitalization has to be reported to the Illinois Department of Public Health within 24 hours, and uh, also influenza-related deaths are reportable, as are influenza A variant infections. The photo on the left here shows a still of the respiratory droplets that are spread from sneezing. Um, 
hospital and the right was an emergency hospital set up to deal with a huge number of people who were sick during the 1918 flu epidemic. So new influenza vaccines are created each year in an effort to best protect against the viral strains predicted to be circulating in the flu season coming up. As I said, there are the two main vaccines, and I use the term IIV or injected vaccine, uh, and the live attenuated inter uh, the live attenuated influenza vaccine, or LAIV, or the nasal vaccine, uh, those are all interchangeable. Um, the IIV abbreviation is followed by a number, indicates how many strains the vaccine protects against, usually either three or four. For example, IIV4 means the vaccine protects against four strains. There are a few options other than the standard vaccine. RIV stands for recombinant influenza vaccine, which is made with recombinant DNA and has a craving flu blot. CCIIV is the cell cultural interactivated influenza vaccine called flu cell vax, and it's a trivalent vaccine. There's also a high dose trivalent IIV vaccine called flu zone high dose. LAIV4 is the live attenuated influenza vaccine, uh, also known as the flu mix vaccine, and it is quadrivalent, with no trivalent version. Um, the nasal sprayer, the live attenuated influenza vaccine, is used in those age two and older. And it's important to note there is no preferential recommendation for the injected or the nasal spray vaccine, as they have both shown to be equally effective in children age two and older. Included here is a table listing the complete options for the pediatric inactivated influenza vaccine for the, for the current flu season. Uh, so you can refer to that if you have a specific question. Now we're going to move on to the NMR vaccine. Uh, uh, the trade names are the MMR2 and ProPod. ProQuad protects against MMR as well as uh, varicella virus. Both of these vaccines contain live attenuated viral strains. The NMR vaccine is given as a two-dose series of subcutaneous injection. It's recommended the first dose be given from 12 to 15 months and the second between four and six years. If doses are missed or delayed, the catch-up recommendation is to give the two-dose series with a minimum of four weeks in between. It's important to ensure that all school-age children have completed their MMR series and most school districts require this. If a child aged 6 to 11 months is traveling outside of the United States, they should receive one dose of MMR, but then will need to receive another two doses uh, per the recommended schedule after the year old. Both of the MMR vaccines uh, need to be reconstituted and stored refrigerated so they come with a billion. Um, ProQuad is, is stored and refrigerated in frozen form, so you have to check and see what you're getting. Uh, severe allergic reaction to a previous component is the contraindication as are severe immunodeficiency and pregnancy. Moderate to severe illness with or without fever is a precaution, and other precautions for the MMR vaccine include uh, recent receipt of antibody-containing blood products, a history of thrombocytopenia or thrombocytopenic purpura, or a need for CDC. US. It's extremely contagious and transmitted via respiratory droplets. Um, the respiratory droplets can remain in an airspace for up to two hours and cause new infections. A person who's infected with measles will infect nine out of ten non-infected people they come into contact with. It's very contagious. Um, and that's why widespread vaccination is critical to preventing disease in a large number of people. The first symptoms of measles are the three C's, cough, coryza, which is a, another word for runny nose, and conjunctivitis. Two to three days after the initial symptoms, small white spots known as complex spots appear in the mouth, and three to five days after initial symptoms appear, a rash consisting of flat red spots start on the face and spread to the neck, limbs, and trunk. The fever, uh, there can be a high fever during this rash stage, and usually the fever and rash subside after a few days. Measles can cause severe or fatal complications, uh, especially in children under age five and immunocompromised patients, as well as in adults over age 20 and in pregnant women. Complications include ear infections, pneumonia, laryngotracheal bronchitis, and diarrhea. Ear infections include their ear infections occur in about 10% of cases and lead can lead to permanent hearing loss. Uh, also, one in a thousand patients with measles will get encephalitis, which can cause permanent brain damage. One or two children in a thousand will get serious respiratory or neurologic complications that can cause death. And there is a rare and fatal uh, post measles disease that can develop seven to ten years after infection and cause degeneration of the central nervous system called SSTD. 
Pneumonia occurs in one in 20 cases and is the leading cause of death from measles. Overall, one to two out of every thousand people who get measles will die, and there's no antiviral treatment for this care. Measles is uh, reportable to the public health and to the CDC. Photo on the up here shows a face of a child with measles, and you can see the runny nose and conjunctivitis, their initial symptoms. And that the other photo shows a child with a characteristic measles rash all over the body. Mumps is a viral infection caused by a paramyxovirus that typically causes pain and swelling in salivary glands. There's been a 99% decrease in the number of cases in the U.S. since the introduction of vaccine. Uh, the number of cases each year varies from hundreds to thousands. For example, in 2010, there were about 2,600 cases, while in 2015, there were about 700 cases. Mumps is very contagious and spread like the cold or through contaminated objects that have been touched by an infected person. Not everyone who gets mumps will have symptoms, but from those who do, they usually appear um, two to three weeks after infection include fever, muscle aches, and the characteristic puppy cheeks and swollen jaw caused by salivary gland inflammation. Most cases recover in a few weeks, but there can be serious complications as well, including uh, inflammation of the testicles and the ovaries, um, encephalitis, meningitis, and deafness. Mumps cases are reportable to the CDC and Illinois Department of Public Health. And here we see a uh, swollen neck and jaw that mumps can cause. Rubella, otherwise known as German measles, is another type of viral infection spread via the respiratory route. Um, similar to measles, rubella was declared eliminated from the U.S. in 20, 2004, but it's still endemic in a lot of parts of the world. About half of people who get infected won't have symptoms, but the most common symptoms are a rash that starts in the face and spreads uh, to the body and a low-grade fever. Um, also, there can be aching joints, swollen glands, and cold leg symptoms prior to the rash. The most serious complications occur in pregnant women who get infected. If they're infected early in pregnancy, there's a 20% chance that their child will develop a constellation of birth defects called congenital rubella syndrome, which occurs cataracts, includes cataract heart defects and hearing impairment. Rubella infection in pregnant women can also result in miscarriage uh, or stillbirth. It's estimated about 100,000 babies are born with congenital rubella syndrome worldwide each year. Rare complications from rubella include hemorrhagic manifestations in 1 in 3,000 cases and encephalitis in 1 in 6,000 cases. Um, and the encephalitis that develops can be deadly. Pregnant women cannot receive the MMR vaccine, which is why it's so important to take the series early in order to provide protection. Uh, this is a rash caused by rubella and a uh, child with cataracts from congenital rubella syndrome. A common concern you might hear from families is whether the MMR vaccine causes autism. It does not. There's been a tremendous amount of research that shows there's no link between the MMR and autism. All of this stemmed from a paper in the 1990s from a doctor in England who said there, a case report, not a, not a study, where he said there could potentially be a link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Um, no other research has ever been able to reproduce this finding. And the article has since been retracted. The doctor who published it has had his license revoked. And there are many, many well-researched peer review articles showing there is no link between MMR vaccine and autism. There's a link there that, uh, a link that'll, in the resources that'll explain some of those uh, studies. Um, now we're going to move on to the varicella vaccine. Protects against chickenpox. Uh, the trade names are Varivax and Propod. Both are live attenuated varicella vaccine. Varicella zoster virus. Proquad, as we mentioned before, protects against MMR as well. The two dose series, given the first dose 12 to 15 months and the second at four to six years. Children and adolescents age seven through 18 years who don't have evidence to immunity need to get the two dose series. And um, there is a link in the resources for what constitutes uh, evidence of immunity. The contraindications are, are the usual, with the exception that there's precaution for the for giving the vaccine to those who have received antibody-containing blood products or received antiviral medicines in the 24 hours prior to vaccine. Um, and those antiviral medicines should not be given in the 14 days after um, the vaccine is given. So chickenpox is the primary infection caused by the varicella zoster virus. Uh, once infected, the virus remains latent in the person's body after the initial chickenpox stage. It can be reactivated lighter, later in life to cause shingles. The vaccine was introduced in 1995, and prior to that, there were about 4 million cases annually in the U.S. with 100 to 150 deaths. Since the vaccine has become available, the number of cases and hospitalizations has decreased by about 90 percent. Chickenpox is extremely contagious, spreads by respiratory droplets or by touching the blisters. 
And those infected with shingles can also give a person uh, chickenpox. The initial symptoms of chickenpox are fever, fatigue, headache, loss of appetite, usually occur one to two days before the characteristic rash appears. The rash usually starts from the face, neck, and back before spreading to the rest of the body, where it turns into itchy, fluid-filled blisters that eventually scab over after about a week. Um, young children, pregnant women, and those with immunocompromised um, conditions are at high risk for, for complications with varicella. And remember not to give uh, aspirin for those who, who suspect varicella. Okay. Um, and this is a video of single agent pediatric vaccines for hepatitis A called Habrix and Vacta. They both contain inactivated virus. Twinrix also protects against hepatitis B and is used for those 18 and older. The recommended schedule is two doses be given between 12 and 23 months with a six months in between. Um, and the contraindications are the usual contraindications. So the vaccine, uh, hepatitis A causes acute liver infection, which is self-limiting and doesn't become chronic. There's been a 95% decrease in hepatitis A infection in the U.S. since the vaccine was introduced in 1995, but the virus is still circulating in the U.S. and causes about 3,500 cases annually, at least in 2015. Uh, some people are at higher risk for being infected, like those with travelers, or travelers to countries where it's highly endemic, like in Africa and Asia. Uh, men who have sex with men, injection and non-injection drug users, and people with blood clotting disorders, and those who work with non-human findings. Um, it's highly contagious virus that's transmitted via the fecal oral route or exposure to contaminated food or water. Um, you'll occasionally hear about outbreaks in food. Um, symptoms are usually begin abruptly, but are not equally present in all age groups. Seventy percent of those under age six have no symptoms. Um, and about 80% of the infected adults will have symptoms, which include nausea, fatigue, vomiting, dark urine, abdominal pain, joint pain, and jaundice. Symptoms usually last for less than two months, although about 10% will have relapses that can go for up to six months. Uh, almost all infected people recover without complications, although sometimes it can cause liver failure and death, usually in those over age 50 or those with other, uh, other liver disease. In 2013, 80 people were reported to have died from hepatitis A. And this is an infected person with jaundice and the video about the importance of hepatitis A vaccine. Um, now we're going to talk about the HPV vaccine. There are three vaccines that protect against HPV. Cervarix is bivalent, meaning it protects against two strains that are known to cause 70% of cervical cancers. And then there's Gardasil, which is quadrivalent form, that protects against those same two strains of Cervarix, plus other, two other strains to cover 90% of general rewards. And now there's Gardasil 9 that protects against nine strains um, that's now recommended as of the newest schedule. Um, it protects against four strains from the regular Gardasil plus five additional strains that are associated with about 14% of HPV-related cancers in women and about 4% of HPV-related cancers in males. Uh, HPV recommendation, or vaccine is strongly recommended for both boys and girls. It's given as a three-dose series, usually between 11 and 12, but can be given as early as nine years. The second dose is given one to two months after the first dose, and the third dose is given six months after the second dose. Um, if the vaccination isn't completed at 11 to 12, adolescents should start the series as soon as possible. Um, there's a catch-up schedule there in the slide. There are over 40 strains of HPV that can infect humans, and some strains cause genital warts and cancer. Many HPV infections do not cause symptoms and are cleared by the body without anybody realizing they actually have it. But some strains of HPV will persist in the body to cause more serious disease. HPV can cause genital warts, cervical cancer, and some less common forms of cancer, including anal, penile, vulvar, vaginal, and oropharyngeal cancer. Both men and women are at risk for developing genital warts or cancer from HPV. It's incredibly common. An estimated 79 million people are infected with it, with about 14 million new infections each year, transmitted uh, via sexual contact. It's the most common sexually transmitted infection in the U.S. Nearly all sexually active people will be infected with at least one strain of HPV throughout their life. An estimated 360,000 people will get genital warts from HPV each year. People infected with HPV are typically asymptomatic. They only know they have it um, either by getting genital warts or by having an abnormal pap smear. HPV directly contributes to the burden of cancer in the U.S. It's estimated to cause about 33,000 cancers each year about 20,000 women and 12,000 men. 
HPV most commonly causes cervical cancer in women and oropharyngeal cancer in men. It's responsible for over 90% of cervical cancer cases every year. It used, cervical cancer used to be the leading cause of cancer death for women, but that's improved with, uh, with detection via past year, but it is still a significant problem. Every year, a total of 11,000 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer and about 4,400 die. Um, HPV is also responsible for over 90% of the cases of anal cancer and over 70% of vaginal, vulvar, and oropharyngeal cancer and over 60% of penile cancer. The increase in the amount of people who get infected with HPV would have a tremendous positive impact on public health. There is no treatment for HPV. The photo on the left here shows an HIV positive patient with wards caused by HPV. Uh, oral HPV is rare, but it can cause secondary infection in the compromised patients. And the image on the right is part of the CDC's campaign to increase the HPV vaccine in adolescents. It's a very important tool in fighting cancer, so it's important that healthcare providers make a strong recommendation for fully vaccinating adolescents when they come in. And the last vaccine we're going to discuss is against meningococcal disease. Um, there are several available meningococcal vaccines to cover all five strains of the bacteria. Please note we're just going to focus on the pediatric meningococcal vaccines today. There are two quadrivalent vaccines that protect against the A, C, W, and Y strains. These are called Menactra and Mendio and are part of the routine vaccine recommendation. There's another called Menhibrix, which protects against the C and Y meningococcal strains as well as Sinopolis and Clinton type B, we talked about earlier. It's only for use in certain high-risk patients. The routine uh, vaccine schedule is to give one dose of Menactra or Mendio for children aged 11 to 12 and then a booster at age 16. Uh, also, anybody aged 11 to 18 with HIV infection should get two doses separated by eight weeks. And finally, it's recommended that children aged two months to 18 years who are at higher risk of contracting meningococcal disease follow an altered vaccine schedule. The risk groups for this recommendation are children with anatomic or functional asplenia, persistent complement deficiency, those traveling to areas where disease is endemic, and those who have been exposed during an outbreak. The schedule is complex um, and depends on what the child situation is but there's a, uh, a link in the footnotes about how to find it. If the child doesn't receive the dose at 11 to 12, they should get it to follow the catch-up schedule. Um, if they get one dose between 13 and 15 years, they should get a booster at 16 years with eight weeks in between those doses. If they get one dose and it's after age 16, if there's one dose given at age 16 to 18, they do not need a second dose. There are also two new FDA-approved vaccines for the B strains of meningococcus named Vexero and Sumenba. Vexero is given as a two-dose series, and Sumemba is given as a three-dose series. Uh, the vaccine doses are not interchangeable, so you have to stick to one brand to finish the series. PCIP has recently released new vaccine recommendations for these products. It's recommended that any people age 10 or older get this vaccine series if they are at high risk of infection with B strain. This is people with uh, asplenia, complement deficiency, those who have been exposed during an outbreak, and microbiologists who work closely with the serum and Adolescents age 16 to 23 can also be given the B-strain series, preferably between age 16 and 18. The ACIP considers this a Category B recommendation, which means that administration for this group is at the discretion of an individual clinician. Um, the vaccine, Menactra is refrigerated. Menvio is um, given with a, a two-component vaccine and virulent that's also refrigerated. And all of the meningitis uh, vaccines are given intramuscularly. Meningococcal disease is a bacterial infection, uh, as I mentioned, caused by Neisseria meningitis. The five strains, A, C, A, B, C, W, and Y, the B, C, and Y strains cause most of the infections in the U.S. Cases of meningococcal disease have been declining since the 90s, and there were about 550 cases in 2013. The highest rates of disease occur in children under age 1 and in adolescents age 16 to 23, and the outbreaks peak in January and February. Um, the pediatric population is particularly at high risk for disease, so vaccine is important. It spreads through respiratory droplets and through saliva. About 10% of people are carriers of this bacteria and their upper respiratory tract are not infected, but can spread this bacteria to other people. Uh, meningococcal disease is very serious and can be fatal in a matter of hours. It's important to quickly recognize the symptoms of disease to prevent as much damage as possible. Um, symptoms typically appear three to seven days after infection, and begin with a sudden onset of fever, headache, and stiff neck. Other symptoms include nausea, vomiting, light sensitivity, and confusion. And meningococcal meningitis can lead to hearing loss, nervous system, and brain damage, or nervous system and brain damage, or death. However, in infants, the symptoms can look different. Infants can just be uh, irritable or overly sleepy, vomiting, not eating well. Um, 
the symptoms for meningitis papillary septicemia include fatigue, vomiting, cold hands and feet, severe aches and pains in the muscles, joint, chest or abdomen, rapid breathing, uh, dark or purple rash. And these infections can be deadly if antibiotics on the street started very, very quickly. This is a um, four, four month old girl with angry to the hand and leg due to meningitis papillary septicemia and a link to a video about uh, uh, somebody with meningitis papillary septicemia. And that about does it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Goldstein, for that wonderful presentation. Very detailed and well informed. Mm -hmm. So if does anybody have any questions at the moment? I don't see any right now. I mean it's perfectly okay to not have questions, you know. It was very detailed. So anyways, um let's just give it about another I don't know. 10 seconds or so to see if we get any questions. And if not, we can go ahead and conclude the webinar. And of course, you know, everyone feel free to email also for any questions or concerns, comments that you have. Okay, so we'll just wrap it up right now. And thank you again, Dr. Goldstein, for the presentation. And I'll be providing a copy of the slides as well as a link to the recorded webinar and I just want to thank everyone who joined us today for this and for being a part of the ROG team. I just want to reiterate how much we appreciate all of the work that you do for us. So that's about it. Then I hope everyone enjoys the warmer weather that we're supposed to have this week. Okay, have a great afternoon everyone. Bye. All right, thank you. Thank you.